Well, like I was saying that today we are very uh, grateful to God for this uh, brand opportunity we have. Last week, um, we we are able to uh, uh, deal with the topic of uh, entering into the office, uh, exploring the office of a teacher. So today, what we want to do is to kind of give you a summary of that quickly. And then we are going to jump right into uh, the Office of Evangelist. So I'm going to take it. I'm going to try for us to get uh, a quick break. Um, I think that will help us if we finish this particular piece. Uh, the Lord give us grace. Then we can take a quick break and then come down to deal with the Office of Evangelist. The Office of Evangelist is a very uh, broad uh, uh, topic, which I know it will bless the brethren. It will bless you. Uh, and it will also bless the family, bless the entire family uh, of faith. Before I start this particular day, I want to ask you to ask yourself a question. Um, am I a teacher? Am I called uh, in the fivefold? That's a question I would like you uh, to ask yourself. Are you a teacher? And if you are a teacher, what are the functions? What are the um, assignments that you are given as a teacher? And if you are a teacher, what operations have the Lord called you to do? And if you are a teacher, how do you make sure you carry out the assignments that God has given to you without creating um, challenges? What are the things that you can learn? What are the things that can make the office of the teacher in your life better? How can you flow in ministry and get more results as a teacher? So as we dive into this particular topic, like I said, we want to see, uh, we want to kind of get you a little bit of an idea of what we dealt with last week, and then we're gonna go right into it. So when you explore the office of the teacher, we wanna define the calling, understanding exactly what the Lord, what the position that God have asked you to do what are the discussion points? What do we mean by heart to heart? So I asked the Lord this morning to actually give me grace so that I can be able to broaden a little bit further on the discussion that we had last week when it come down to the office of the teacher. And I believe that a lot of folks had some things that blessed them when it come down to that particular topic. What are the broadening views? What are the approaches? that you can use? How can you expand the call of God in your life um, as a teacher? What are the practical strategies that you must apply? And what are the maturity steps that you must do to make sure you do that? So as we, let's look into Matthew 28, verse 19 through 20, uh, where Jesus sent them out, go you. And then you look into 2 Timothy chapter two, from verse two to four which emphasizes about the Great Commission, the things that God have actually desired that we do. And Paul say, and the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people. Father, I pray that we entrust to reliable people. Now question for you as a teacher, are you reliable? And that's the question that comes in, are you reliable? trust. So when you are looking at the office of a teacher, we are looking at the enablement of reliability in ministry. We are looking at reliability in equipping, reliability in enforcement. And therefore it's also saying here, reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So as a teacher, you are being enabled, thank you Holy Ghost, so that you can enable others. Give somebody a high five on this. You are enabled so that you can enable others. So you are a tool, an enabling tool that God is using to stretch himself. All right? You are going to commit that on to reliable people. All right? So now we're going to reflect on how Jesus himself was the ultimate teacher and how his ministry exemplified his teaching. We are looking at the heart of a teacher. What's the heart of the teacher? Yeah. Hallelujah. So as an instructor yourself, all right, 
as a teacher in ministry, there are some qualities that must come handy. Number one, we talked about humility. Number two, compassion and passion for the truth. So I'm just kind of getting back to what we discussed so that we can get to the new fresh wine. And I also want to talk to you about the heart of a teacher, all right? The heart of a teacher, let's look into the story of Ezra, right? Ezra um, chapter 8, from verse 1 to 8. I would like you to follow me with this. And then it's, this there's a biblical uh, story behind Ezra, all right? Ezra, who, who is a diligent man, taught God's word when he returned from exile, right? Now, all now, that what says all these people came uh, yeah, they all came together in one of the square before the water gates. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law which Moses have given, okay, and have commanded for Israel. So, as the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it out loud from daybreak till noon. So that's so many hours, right? He read the word, and that's the assignment of a teacher, all right? So that people can understand, all right? And therefore, go ask a square before the water gate in the presence of all men, women, and others who could understand. All the people listened attentively. You want to mark that because it's important for you. They listened attentively. Ezra, the teacher of the law stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right was Metatia, Shema, Anna, Uriah, Heka, Mekeah, and all that left again, Mekeah, Misha. These are all just names. Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. So a teacher is not somebody that goes into hide. It's somebody that makes himself available. Give somebody high five and ask them, do you make yourself available? He opened the book. He read it where they can all see him. Verse 6 said, Ezra, praise the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, and amen, and amen. And then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord and their forces to the ground. The Levites, Joshua, Bani, Shremer, Jami, Akub, Shekher, um, Amukhadu, Masia, um, Kalita, Azariah, uh, Jezabed, Hannah, and Perea instructed the people. I want you to mark that in your Bible. As a reason why when I started today, I asked you, those of you who are online, you are not going to get this piece because we have, <laughs> we have my leaders who are on Zoom. So I asked you to give me a little bit of information on what's going on uh, within your territory. You see, leaders that are true leaders, they carry orders along. You want to write that down somewhere. They carry orders along. So um, Ezra, the Bible talked about, he have empowered others who also went in and spoke. All right? Who went, went in. All right, make it clear, then given the meaning of the people understood what was being said. So it is very vital here that when you are in, when you are empowered, you have to find those who are faithful, who are reliable, and also empower them. Now, if you read verse 9, even though it's not part of the context here, then um, Nehemiah, in this case, is a governor, Ezra, the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people. You see how powers have shifted? Everybody, not one person is doing it. They are all doing their individual part to build up this kingdom. So it's also part of you as a teacher. You are looking at the congregation. You are looking at a network. You are looking at the people. You are looking at the community. You are not focusing on yourself. So you are here to equip also others. Now, got a question for you. How do you navigate challenges? Can you just turn around, ask the person next to you, how do you navigate challenges? If you're on Facebook, just type in there, how do I navigate challenges? You may have to find some good ideas how you navigate challenges as a teacher. You got to address, number one, you must address common struggles. Smile and say amen. You must, you must address common struggles 
faced by teachers, such as impatience. Can you write that down? Are you saying Apostle, uh, Apostle Did is impatient of the certain point we have to allow impatience? Also, some challenges are what they call teacher burnout. Those of you who are in the education world, you know what I'm talking about, teacher burnout. And the third part is also doubt. Did you get that part? I'm going to repeat it one more time. Some of the challenges that we are going to navigate as a teacher is you are going to deal with the struggles of impatient, the struggle of burnout. You keep walking, 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 never refreshing. I gave some information last time. Some people misunderstood it. Some people got the picture where I say to them clearly, I put it clear to them, especially to leaders, made it clear that you're going to be trained. You can't give what you don't have, all right? You also want to avoid the burnout. And that's why Ezra, not just himself, the Levites assisted him in teaching. If you have a big, you know, a big state, all right, many places you want to go to, you cannot do it all by yourself. I, we all, I hope we are all getting this picture here today. If there's nothing else, don't miss this. You are not doing it all by yourself. I was reading a story in Numbers, and God would begin to speak to me also how the Israelis were complaining. And God told Moses to get 70 men and put his spirit within them, and God is going to touch them. They will be able to help share the Lord. The more teachers we got in Springboard, the more teachers we have in your community, the better the work can go. And therefore, we can now limit and cut down on burnout. Doubt is a big thing also we must also avoid. We have to encourage reliance on God's strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you all getting that picture? It's very, very vital that you depend on the Holy Spirit when there are issues. Now, let me get you to understanding your audience. Smile and say amen. Yeah, we're going to hit, we're going to hit the ground running. How do you deal with your audience as a teacher? Touch somebody. If you're on Facebook, you're, you can type in there. How do you, and those of you who are students, these are going to be some responses that you will be giving back, all right? How do you deal with your audience? It could be your targeted audience. It could be your now audience. How do you deal with your audience? And how do you make, how do you talk and get your audience interested and make things relevant? You must know, you must know your audience. You must know your students. Write that down. So you must know your students. You must know your crowd. How do you do that? Number one, you must understand the cultural context and audience relevance. What are they looking for? What's your audience looking for? Study the cultural context of biblical times and how it impacts teaching. Oh, smart. Now, this is, this is now a big one. All right? I want you to analyze, if you're a student, and analyze, okay, how Jesus tailored the teaching to specific audience. For example, how did Jesus deal with Nicodemus as a teacher? Are we still here? How did Jesus deal with Nicodemus? Remember, this is like a one-man ministry. How was Jesus' action? Jesus was working with the crowd. How did Jesus able to separate those two things and still minister a one-on-one -on -one to Nicodemus? These are questions you're going to have to ask yourself by studying more. Okay? Jesus told, I'm going to be in your house. How did Jesus be able to understand the cultural issues and be able to specific audience? How did Jesus deal with the Samaritan woman? Anybody know the story of the Samaritan woman? The woman that Jesus waited until his apostles went into town. Jesus was able to ask the woman specifically questions. Oh, I love that part. Jesus built a teaching ministry by understanding how he's dealing with different people and not a one size that fits all. Jesus had a one on one conversation teaching with this woman and convinced her call your husband. I call that an icebreaker. Go get your husband. Jesus knew him. And so you need word of knowledge. Are you listening to me? You need a word of knowledge. You need a word of wisdom at times to get this ministry to function in a way that it will bring more praise to Elohim. Where's your husband? I don't have any. Why do you say you don't have any? You already got five. And the last one you're saying now is neither your husband. Jesus used the gift and within himself to make the connection so his teaching gift will flow. My God, take that. That's, that, that's a big high five right there. 
Jesus understood how to deal with the crowd. Jesus understood how to make sure that he knows his crowd. So for you as a student today, I want you to take this and make it very serious because we are rushing time. Next thing, the learning styles and spiritual maturity of your crowd. You're going to put this down. You're going to put this down. So you as a leader, you as a leader have to make sure you explore various learning styles. Okay? You got to learn, you got to know learning styles. If you are dealing with the church or ministry, you got to find out if your audience, if they are visual, if they're auditory, or if they are kinesthetic. You got to figure out and adapt your teaching methods accordingly. May I say that one more time? You have to figure out your crowd and adapt so that you can deliver teachings that are relevant. There are places I know that take more online courses because that's, you know, that's the, that's the, that's the culture around that area. That's the influence. That's what get result. And there are some places you go to, they don't want to talk about that it, because for them, it's like a challenge to even talk about going online. So you got to be able to figure out what your crowd is. First Corinthians chapter three, verse one to three. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the spirit, but as people who are still worldly, more infant, since there is a jealousy and quarreling among you, you are worldly and you act. Paul very said it here. So you as a believer, you have to figure out what Paul was talking about here. Paul was dealing with a very immature group. So he changed his style. You know, so you as a teacher, are you able to change your style based on what's going around you? The next thing I want you to touch today is about building relationship. I'm just giving you a recap. Building relationship. So you as a leader, you as a teacher, must emphasize the importance of, of authentic relationship with students, with the people you are listening to. Let me quickly stop you here. Let's say that you are dealing with a farmer, all right? You are uh, in a place that it's a, uh, it's a rural area. You are dealing with a farmer. How do you connect a farmer to your message? Well, you can start by seed, all right? If you want to go that route, all right? Look and see the things that are relevant to the person that you are communicating to, if it is a person. If it is a church, look at the church population, all right? Is it a blue collar? What type of population are you dealing with? That way you know precisely how you can be able to take from where they are to shine light. Paul, for example, he waited. They start talking about an unknown God. So Paul picked from that unknown God and shared the message of Jesus Christ. So you got to be able to share examples of biblical mentors. Use things that you know that works in that community to move to the next level. I'm moving faster here. Now let's look at some practical tips, practical tips. I'm dealing with students today and I want to make sure that we get this done so that we can move to the next thing. How, what are the practical steps that you must take um, as a leader to make sure that you are bringing home the money or you are bringing home some result, okay? Lesson planning, you want to write that down. You must craft effective lesson planning. As a teacher, as an instructor, you must craft lesson plan. So it doesn't matter how voluminous the teaching you want to get. Let's say you want to go into some commentaries, right? As a teacher, let's say that I'm trying to break it down so we can understand, right? As a teacher, you have a congregation of 50 people, a congregation, or maybe you are doing Sunday school in the morning as a teacher. So I, what I want to emphasize that all of our churches should be trying to get teachers to do Sunday school. Some Sunday school are so boring. Even Jesus wouldn't stay in there. I'm just kidding now, all right? They are so boring because, and at times, they, they, they get the wrong people to do some of these teachings, right? The Bible studies on Wednesdays or Thursdays, they get the wrong people to do it. And so they do it sometimes because of familiarity or somebody they know. Get an effective teacher who can do an effective lesson plan, right? Since we got to have some sort of structure, lesson planning and structure, teach the art of lesson planning with an objective, my God with an introduction, with the body and application. This is something that is common sense. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8, for example, in 8, okay? They read from the book, from the law of God, 
clearly and how they gave again the sense so that the people understood the reading. They read from the book of the law and then clearly explain the meaning of what is being read, helping the people understand that. So it is very vital for you to write a process and procedure that you are going to use with your congregation, with the public, with the community, whoever you're dealing with. Because lack of that, you are going to say, I depend on the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I, I agree too, but write things down. Next thing, engage on teaching methods. I, again, we are dealing with practical application now, and I'm hoping that some of you are going to get this part. They engage with teaching methods. Let me explain here. I want you to look at, for example, the parables that Jesus used. Now, let me ask you this question. Did Jesus use parables? He used a lot of that, right? Jesus used a lot of questions. Jesus used a lot of illustrations. Jesus used a lot of interactive discussions. Are you getting the picture? I'm trying to get now to the bottom line when it deals with teachers. You got to understand how to use parables, right? To communicate. You got to understand how to use questions to communicate. You got to understand how to use illustrations, maps to communicate as a teacher. So it's not just one. Sometimes some teach, some teachers use they, they they use PowerPoint to communicate the uh, teaching. So you are not just there to just read a book. You got to communicate. You got to use figures. You got to use symbols. All these are all methods that you are going to use to make it an, a very impactful one. Also, how Jesus uh, used these methods effectively. These are questions that you must also respond as a student. How did Jesus use all these methods effectively as a teacher? I hope we are all getting that. What I'm trying to do today is download you some of the quick things you need to put up as a teacher as you grow effectively. Last part we're going to talk about with this teaching is the impact and legacy. Tell somebody say impact. So tell somebody say impact and legacy. What's going to be the impact you are going to make and what's going to be the legacy you are going to keep? And these are all effective tools if we are going to carry out. One is that we must plan to leave a lasting effective work. A lasting a lasting mark. You want to write that down. You want to leave an, a, a lasting mark as a teacher. Very, very important. Some people don't think that this is important. They just say, well, Apostle Didi, I'm just doing God's work. I'm going to share with you some good examples, right? You got to, again, we got to plan to leave a mark. And let me give you some good examples here. Um, some modern day Bible teachers, which can probably help you, all right? Um, Beth Moore, all right? Beth Moore is, is, a, is, a, is a renowned uh, Bible teacher. And to those of you, I want you to actually take some time and go in and do some of your own homework on this, okay? That's very, very important, all right? You've got to be able to, uh, because it's very important for us to equip and address tough questions with grace and truth. It's also good for you to know what other people can do. So for the last piece here for this teaching, I want to share with you some of the key, um, some of the leaders who have operated in the area you're going to go in right now. Okay, Beth Moore is a lady, renowned Bible teacher, okay, founder of a Living Proof Ministries. Her passionate uh, teaching style and, and, and also commitment to biblical um, okay, accuracy uh, have inspired um, countless of women uh, worldwide. And what's her legacy? Through her Bible stories, her Bible stories, her conferences and books, Beth Moore has encouraged women to drive deep into scripture, grow in faith, and live out their calling. Why am I giving you this? So you got to look at other people who have been before you, all right? We always lean on the wings of those who have been before us. So it's good for you to look at some of the people I'm mentioning to you here today. Maybe there are more. Also, um, um, Ravi Zakaria, many of you know him. There were some issues last time I heard. I'm not sure whether it's true or not, but I'm going to just tell you some of the things that I know that he has done. For example, his impact, okay? He's an apologist, also uh, and also a gifted communicator. Uh, his ministry, uh, which we call the 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 the, the, the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries or RZIM, um, is a global ministry. All right, and what did he do? He had to have that Christian faith, um, basically engage those who are what they call skeptics. Anybody have done with a skeptic here in ministry? Somebody who just like doubt everything. Okay, as a teacher, you're going to confront this from time to time. But how do you deal with a skeptic, right? How do you deal with folks who have no faith? How do you deal with somebody, um, Jehovah um, Witness, okay, group? 
uh, there's a name I call, but I, you'll leave it on you have a witness group. How do you deal with them when they come to your house, knocking on the door as a teacher and trying to sometimes embarrass you, right? How do you handle those? Now, let me ask you this question. As a teacher, how do you handle embarrassing situations that some members can cause by bringing questions that are irrelevant? Not all the time, but they just want to pull your leg, all right? So this great teacher shares a lot in depth on basically those and how he dealt with them, all right? John Piper, I'm giving some examples, people you want to look up. John Piper. John Piper is the founder of Desiring God. I have emphasis on the supremacy of God in all things, okay? His expository uh, theology writing have shaped countries and believers. And what's his legacy? He influenced extends through the books, his sermons and Christian, uh, again, when they're dealing with the concept of finding God's glory. We are also dealing with uh, K, um, K author, right? Like A U A R T U R. I'm giving you so that we are dealing with things that you need to know, all right? His impact, all right? He's a co founder uh, of Precept Ministries International, emphasizing an inductive Bible study methods. Saints, I want you to write this down inductive Bible study methods. Um, because I'm limited in time, I could have taken some time to explain and bring expository teaching on this. Sometimes people miss it because they don't go through this. Now, I always ask some, there are some part of our classes which I've asked ministers, especially those who are going in biblical studies too, those who are going in um, in the pastoral, to make sure they go into uh, exploring the Old Testament and the New Testament. I always ask people to take some time, although we didn't put that as part of major in our curriculum, but I think it's important for you to go through the Old and New Testament series and training so you can understand basically how you can analyze those when needed, all right? And his legacy here um, in his a countless small group, some people are very good in small group, uh, studies, again, inspired, encouraging people to dig into God's word. Let me pack here a little bit, all right? So as a teacher, you got to understand when conferences are being done, that's when your giftings at times shows a lot, especially when there are small groups. Amen. So those of you who are rising stars and rising leaders, make your teachers available to handle small groups. Test them from, from ground up. Don't just put somebody over the pedestal because you had the big name. Have them be tested and tried out, okay? Next person is Team Killer, all right? Like, it's Team Killer, and I'm going to uh, put it clear the way it is. It's, uh, let me make sure I get that right. Okay, it's K E L L E R. I want to make sure I pronounce it right so you don't um, go in and pronounce that wrong and say, well, that's what the Apostle Didi said. All right. I um, mean, his impact also, uh, as the pastor adds again, he have operated on podcasts, influencing urban, uh, urban Christians a lot, emphasizing the gospel centers and cultural engagement. Now you got Priscilla Shira. All right. Um, she have an engaging speaker and order encouraging women to seek God passionately, okay? And then you have orders, all right? But why am I saying this before I, I, I bring this part? Because I want you to understand that you can be the next one to add your name there. Now, let me talk about some practical steps to enhance your teaching. Give somebody a high five. Give somebody a high five. Let them know that here comes the word, all right? How do you, as a teacher enhance your teaching? How do you enhance your teaching? That's the question. You all hear me, right? How do you enhance your teaching? How do you move from step to step, from grace to grace, from passion to passion? How do you carry out that work? All right, I'm going to give you some steps here. The first step is the, the habit of preparation. Enhancing means you already got the gift. You're already in the office of a teacher, but you want to enhance it. So this is not a place where somebody say, well, let me go and learn some skills, all right? And then I'm going to go ahead and know this. This is how you can enhance the skill that God already put in you. Number one, you must have a habit of preparation. Smile and say amen. Prepare diligently. Take time to study. Prepare your lessons thoroughly. Labor. Uh, you want to write that word down. Labor over your notes. Practice and refine your content. And this is especially for younger teachers who want to run out there because they read something online and they want to start talking about it without doing their home research, all right? 
serve with excellence. Serve with excellence. I'm still dealing with habit here, right? And again, recognize that teaching is an honorable calling and avoid winging lessons. Did you hear me very well? Avoid winging it, okay? In the last minute preparation or prep, aim to give your best. Anytime I come before you, I say to the Lord, make this the best as never been before. Even when my temperament sometimes are not in correlation, okay? Uh, some days I want to do some extensive teaching and somehow the devil just threw a big load somewhere, right? Like today, there are some challenges, all right, um, before I got here. But I got here on time, which is great, all right? The next thing is you must have as a practical step is you must have the habit of love, the habit of love, right? Love your learners. You cannot bless somebody that you curse. Can you take that to the bank? You cannot. I had one, one teaching uh, today, which is a foolish teaching, um, from somebody I really did respect in ministry. So I'm not sure. I hope that that's an AI-generated teaching, that the guy was basically pronouncing a blessing to his congregation. I was pronouncing that every other Christian in the world will bow down to them. I started to laugh. I said, I don't know who put this guy to be Jesus Jr. These are all false teaching. You got to love your learners, all right? Cultivate genuine love for the people you teach. Spend time with them. Listen to their needs and build authentic relationship. Sometimes when people begin to teach false doctrines, they either don't have it and they're trying to cover up or they're trying to make people to like them. It doesn't really work. Work in overflow of love. Let your study flow from the heart that is genuinely concerned for the students or the people's growth. In this case, your church or the ministry's growth. Make sure that you have a reason that you do what you do, that you're not just doing it because there's a vainglory or there's something that you want an interest again out of it. So you must love. Also have the habit of prayer. Write that down, okay? Intercede regularly. I'm giving you some ways to enhance your teaching gift. Keep the list of names and needs. Pray for your students, your church members, individually, that you're going to minister to and seek God's guidance in your teaching. Pray over your words. Keep list of those names you need. Bring before God everything before you share them. Pray over each word. Ask God to keep you from error and help you bear fruit through your teaching. Are you all following me? The next part is that you must have a passion for God's word. Model passion, right? Your enthusiasm for Bible will impact your students or your hearers. If you are not insp inspiring, people will also be that way. So be genuinely excited about God's word. I'm giving you some clues on how you can enhance your teaching grace. Share your journey. Let your passion, again, be contagious. Talk about you. I travel a lot, and I tend to bring in my trips through my teachings. And at times, and that's why, for example, we've been dealing um, a lot when it comes down to uh, first start, all right? When I go to a place, I want to figure out what is going there. I want to pray over the nation. I want to be part of the nation building. That's first start. So I believe that any place I go to, God want to refresh that. So what do I do as a teacher? I speak to the heavens. I speak to the earth. I decree and declare for more doors to be opened so I can teach. And Paul even prayed that prayer. He said, pray that there will be an open door. So when I go to a place, I pray for open door. I bring the courier grace. Did you hear what you said? I bring the courier grace. I am a courier of God's grace. So whenever I go, there must be a blessing from the Lord that I am bringing into that city, I'm bringing into that town, I'm bringing into that village because I have a career. Jesus lives in me. The grace of God lives in me. The anointing of God lives in me. So where I am, if they need to do what Jesus do, which means that if you are in a wedding and they need an extension of something to drink, you can say, Lord, I am here because I'm a carrier of your grace. I can do all things through Jesus that strengthens me. 
I can carry out that function, which is apostolic, or in this particular case, is teaching. So you must have a passion and share your journey. Let people know about your stories. Tell them how to get a transformed life. Last part of this is that you are a facilitator. Can you write that down somewhere? You are, as a teacher, you are a facilitator and not a speaker. Wow, Apostle Daddy, how does that work? Well, we have to enforce interactive teaching. Are you following me? We have to make interactive teaching a culture, okay? Question and answers, discussions, parables. Jesus said, who do men say I am? Oh my God, I love that. When before you can enhance his teaching, who do men say I am? And they begin to get into their guessing ministry. And Peter said, you are Jesus, the son of God. And then he went forth. And Jesus was looking for cues to build his connection. Are you listening to me as a teacher, right? Jesus was there as a facilitator and not as a speaker. So you must see yourself as a facilitator not just a speaker, okay? Encourage discussion, smile and say amen. Encourage questions, smile and say amen. Encourage engagement. You must engage with your audience. You must engage with the people who are listening. You can't just make it a one-way street, okay? You must also create a means of dialogue. Give somebody a high five. Give somebody a high five. Say you create a means of dialogue. Yes, it's very, very important, right? You got to invite your students, hallelujah, okay, to explore scriptures together. So if you are a teacher, and let's say you're handling a study center, up to a certain point, you stop asking people to write things down, create a smaller group, help them discuss, help them interact, ask them to talk about their experiences, create a... Uh, um, uh, a foreplay. And a foreplay is the ability for you, for every person in your group to become part of that particular group where you can make a case. You can make what they call a case study. Take a case scenario. A case scenario is you can put one or two or three people and one will act like a farmer. If you are in the farming area, one will act like a as a teacher. Just like what, what young children do during the Christmas time, they do all this beautiful decoration and they do a foreplay of the coming of Jesus or the birth of Jesus. Encourage that in your classroom, but now do it as a teacher, okay? Put people in place like you are hearing the word of God for the first time. What's going to be your behavior? Create those things. The work of God should be fun and not all the time impounding like you're fighting with somebody. So create and facilitate group interaction and foster a learning community. I want you to remember this, okay? Excellence in teaching is about consistent daily habits. Smile and say amen. So as you cultivate these practices, you become a more effective Bible teacher impacting people's lives and lives to come. Now, I'm not sure. I'm trying to see. Um, there are some parts I have here, but I'm not sure if I can see. But let me give it to you quickly. Um, I know that it's not part of it, but it's dealing with how, how do teachers, again, um, yeah, I think it's important. How do you, as a teacher, um, connect with apostle and serve the church and Christian community? How do you, as a teacher, connect with apostles and serve the church and Christian community as you go? Oh, my goodness. I give God praise for this. We are going to get this, all right, because of time, all right? So there are things that you must do. Number one, number one, you want to write this down. Establish relationships, all right? At, okay, attend church services, okay? Join small groups. I'm talking about regularly in the local church, whatever you want to go, all right? Serve ministries. I'm just giving you some of the hit points, all right? Serve ministries, all right? Volunteer for different services as a teacher. Don't wait to be called. Step in and do something, okay? Events, connect with apostles, seek opportunities, right? So interact with church leaders, including apostles or pastors. Attend these meetings or conferences. Like we're here today, right? Some students decide not to show up, yet they want to get it. No, like I said, you can give what you don't have. It's input in 
and also impute and output, right? Okay? Some people are like, Apostle, just bless me from whatever you are, but they don't come close, right? They don't give in their time. You can't get it that way, all right? Pray and seek guidance, all right? Seek that guidance from God. Participate in outreach. I'm giving you some cues now, okay? Community service, engage in that. Evangelism, if they engage in that. Study scriptures together. Like I said, study together, okay? Learn from apostolic examples. Study how the apostles serve and connected with their communities. Learn from sacrificial love. Amen. And connected with their community. Attend conferences and seminars. Okay? Attend the ones that the apostles connect with. Be humble and uh, teachable. And then submit to authority. All right? So I will stop here. There are other things that will help you later on. We can talk about uh, how to make teaching lessons more engaging. That's a separate thing that I can share with you. Now, I'm going to jump up over here and ask if anybody have any question. Uh, if you're online, if you have any question, you want to ask that because I do know that um, I'm going to give a little bit of a break, okay? Particularly for those of you online, and then we're going to get to those uh, in the office um, of the of the evangelist, which will take, will take a five minutes or 10 minutes break. And then we'll come back today with the Office of Evangelists. Anybody? Oh, I have, again, um, uh, <laughs> okay. Apostle Victor, he said that there's a patient from, uh, patients from uh, Uganda. Amen. We welcome those from Uganda. Uh, amen. God bless you. We love you. We're excited to have you. We're excited because you're here. And we trust the Lord for his giftings, for his blessings. Endure it forever. Do we have any question at all because of time? I'm having some challenge with technology here. Do anybody have any question at all? Before we take a quick break. Any question from anybody? Apostle Victor, any of your group have any question before we take a quick break? Hallelujah. Good morning, Apostle Diddy. God bless you. God bless you. Any question, Pastor Sonny? Any question? A quick question. Uh, uh, no practical steps to enhance the teachings um, uh, uh, does work. How about in some area you have all the preparation? Uh, you have all the preparation and uh, the last minute and uh, the Holy Ghost is leading you in a different route. All right. Pastor Sonny, I ask questions based on what we have there. Uh, the Holy Spirit will not lead you against the word. I want to make that very clear. People make judgments without discernment, and they say it's the Holy Spirit. When you're preparing, the Holy Spirit is there, right? And these are the challenges I have with um, many leaders who do not have a structure. We want people to begin to en entertain structure. Structure is very, very important. Without the structure, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. So um, intuition, I believe in the word of knowledge. But I also believe that people have gone into play. Teaching grace and a preaching grace. So I'm dealing with teaching. So the first thing I'll ask you to do is make sure that there is adequate preparation that is done. The Holy Spirit will guide you, but I would like you to, first of all, stick on preparation. Because the what we have seen in the past, a lot of training I've gone to is that people now don't prepare because they say the Holy Spirit is going to tell them otherwise. Are you, are you, are you following me? Prepare like all things depends on preparation. While you're preparing as a teacher, the Holy Spirit is there if the person is gifted as a teacher. You got to remember, like I said, this is for those who are operating in the office of a uh, teacher. When we deal with apostolic, we'll be pastoral, we will discuss that, Pastor Sonny. But what we are talking about today is the office of a teacher. Any other question? Amen. Amen. All right. So what we are going to do is we are going to take a five minutes, a 10 minutes break. Um, and that means I'm going to get off the ones, people who are online, five or 10 minutes break. We're going to come back. I want you to go refresh, drink something. We're going to be dealing with a very heavy topic in the office of the evangelist. I'm so excited about it. 
and that uh, and uh, and uh, and that the pastor Sonny, uh, since you operate a lot with that type with with evangelistic, that's something that you're going to also see there, and I will help you. All right, so I'll see you back in five ten minutes. Amen.